Welcome to lecture eight. We're going to focus on a concept called the vanishing sphere. What we're going to be doing is looking at the volume of spheres in d dimensions and then taking a limit as d goes to infinity and we'll find out that any finite radius sphere in large dimensions has vanishingly small volume. So the first thing we want to do is determine our coordinates for the d-dimensional space and from that we want to determine what the equation of a sphere is. So we'll start with our d-dimensional vector x which is the tuple x1, x2, x3 all the way up to xd and then the obvious generalization of the sphere will be defined by x dot x is less than or equal to r squared with r being the radius and we can write that out explicitly. That would say x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared all the way up to xd squared is less than or equal to r squared. That's clearly the definition of a sphere in d dimensions. Next what we have to do, and this is a little bit more harder, is we've got to go to spherical coordinates in d dimensions because it's much easier to integrate the volume of the sphere in spherical coordinates than it is in some other coordinates. So we know that we're going to have a radial coordinate r and then we're going to have a whole bunch of angles and you might ask how many angles well the number of angles is going to be equal to the number of dimensions d minus one just like we saw in 2d there's one angle in 3d there's two angles and so forth so in d dimensions there'll be d minus one angles and then we have to ask okay how can i determine each of the different coordinate directions well the first one is just the same as the way that it's done in three dimensions. I pick some axis and the angle from that axis to the r vector will be called theta1 and then x1 will just equal the projection onto that first axis which will be r cosine theta1. And then the next one will be the projection perpendicular to that. So I'll have a r sine theta1 then projected onto the new axis which will give me a cosine theta2. And then this procedure continues. x3 will be r sine theta 1 sine theta 2, and then the projection on the new axis, cosine theta 3. And then x4 will be r sine theta 1 r sine theta 2 sine theta 3, and then cosine theta 4. And this continues. I can get all the way towards the end. x to the d minus 1 will be r sine theta 1 sine theta 2, all the way out to sine theta d minus 2 with a cosine theta d minus 1 to project onto that last axis. And then the final coordinate, xd, will have all of the trig functions being sines. And if you compare this with the way that it worked in three dimensions, you'll see that this is the appropriate generalization of spherical coordinates into higher dimensions. And now you have to ask, all right, so uh, what is the volume element going to be? Well, the first thing we need to note is that all of the angles are going to run from 0 to pi except for the last one, which runs from 0 to 2 pi. Once again, very similar to what happens in three dimensions. And then the volume element becomes dr, then I have a r d theta 1, then I have a r sine theta d theta 2, and an r sine theta 1 sine theta 2 d theta 3, and so forth. You can see I get additional projections onto more and more axes as I go to the higher indexed angles theta sub i, so that the last one is r sine theta 1 sine theta 2 all the way up to sine theta d minus 2 d theta d minus 1. So now if you look at this carefully, you see there's an r in every factor except for the first. So I'm going to get r to the power d minus 1. There's a sine theta 1 in every term except for the theta 1 term. And so I'm going to get sine theta 1 to the d minus 2 power and then I'll get sine theta 2 to the d minus 3 power, and so forth, and then sine theta d minus 2 only will appear to 1 power. So I have to put all of this together, and we can get the equation for the volume of the sphere as a multiple integral, but you should be able to easily understand exactly where this integral is coming from. This shouldn't look like magic to you. So the volume of the d sphere is going to be an integral from 0 to r, that being the radius, dr, r to the d minus 1, that's collecting all the r factors, an integral from 0 to pi d theta 1 sine raised to the d minus 2 power of theta 1. That's collecting all of the sine theta 1 terms. An integral from 0 to pi d theta 2 sine theta, th that should be sine theta 2 raised to the power d minus 3. And all the way down to integral 0 to pi d theta d 
d minus 2, sine theta d minus 2. And then the last integral goes from 0 to 2 pi. And it's just a d theta d minus 1 because there's no sign of that angle that appears in the integration measure for the volume. Once again, similar to what happens in three dimensions. Okay, that last integral, because there's no trig functions in it, just is going to give 2 pi. And all of the other integrals for the angles are of the form sine raised to some power alpha of theta integrated d theta from 0 to pi. We're going to call that integral in general i of alpha. And now we have to figure out how do I evaluate i of alpha. The standard way to try this, we only have a few tricks in our book that we can try. We have the inverse chain rule, we have integration by parts, and so forth. There isn't very many different things that we can try. This one looks like one that is a good one to give a try for integration by parts. I'm going to pick u as sine to the alpha minus 1 of theta. And I'm going to pick v prime equals sine theta. Then v is going to equal minus cosine theta. And so i of alpha will equal minus cosine theta sine alpha minus 1 of theta evaluated between 0 and pi plus alpha minus 1. I have to di differentiate the u term. I'll get an alpha minus 1 cosine theta sine to the alpha minus 2 of theta. And then the v term is the minus cosine theta, which is why I have an overall plus in front of that integral. Now you can see I've got two factors of cosine. There's a cosine squared theta in that integral. I can replace that by 1 minus sine squared theta. And then you see if I replace the cosine squared theta by 1 minus sine squared theta, I'm going to get an i to the alpha minus 2. I'll get a sine to the alpha minus 2 integral minus an i of alpha because I'll get an extra fa two factors of sine squared from that conversion of cosine squared to sine squared. And there's a minus sign in front. Furthermore, if I look at the first term and evaluate it at 0 and at pi, if alpha is bigger than 1, then sine of 0 and sine of pi are both equal to 0. But when alpha equals 1, I get the evaluation of cosine theta from 0 to pi, minus cosine theta from 0 to pi, and that gives me 2. So in the case where alpha equals 1, that first term, which we call the boundary term, is going to evaluate to 2. And in all other cases, it's going to equal 0. So we can put that together in the following form. We use this symbol 2 delta alpha equals 1. That means delta alpha equals 1 means that it dealt that function delta, it's called a chronic or delta function, is equal to 0 unless alpha equals 1, in which case it's equal to 1. So that encompasses the case where that boundary term is 0 everywhere except for the case where alpha is equal to 1. And then the second term will get an alpha minus 1 times i of alpha minus 2 minus i of alpha. Now you see there's an i of alpha on both sides. So I can bring that i of alpha over to the left hand side and I get alpha i of alpha equals alpha minus 1 i of alpha minus 2 plus 2 delta alpha equals 1. This is what is called a recursion relation. If I know a i alpha, I can get the i alpha for two larger val uh, when I add two to alpha. So if I know i of alpha minus two, I can determine i of alpha from this recursion relation. I would just divide the whole thing by alpha in evaluating this. So let's take a look at it. Well, what case do we actually know? Well, if alpha equals one, under the assumption that i of alpha minus one is equal to zero, or you can just directly integrate in the case where alpha equals 1, you find that i of 1 is equal to 2. And now I use the recursion to evaluate i of 3. I get i of 3 is equal to 2 divided by 3 times i of 1. Well, i of 1 was equal to 2. So I get 2 times 2 over 1 times 3. If I look for i of 5, I will get 4 divided by 5 times i of 3. So I get an extra factor of 4 divided by 5. If I look at i of 7, that will get an extra factor of 6 divided by 7. i of 9 will give an extra factor of 8 over 9. And you can pretty much see there's a pattern developing here. In the numerator, I have one extraneous factor of 2, and after that I have 2 times 4 times 6 times 8, etc. I can factor a 2 out of each of those integers, which will give me a factor of 2 to the n. And then I get 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. You can recognize that as a factorial. 
In the denominator, I'm getting 1 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 9. That looks like a factorial, but it's only the odd numbers, not the even ones. And it turns out that this combination often comes up in combinatoric problems, and so we've created a new symbol for it, which I'm going to show you right here. So we can generalize this and actually calculate i of 2n plus 1 is equal to 2 raised to the n plus 1 power times n factorial divided by 2n plus 1 double factorial, where the double factorial sign means only pick the odd integers. So it's 1 times 3 times 5 all the way out to 2n plus 1. You should take a look at that formula, verify that it agrees with i of 9, i of 7, i of 5, i of 3, i of 1, etc. to really verify that that formula is correct. Okay, so now let's look at even n. For even n, I have to actually evaluate i of 2. That's an integral from 0 to pi d theta of sine squared theta. Since this is over a half period, I can replace the sine squared theta by a half, and then I just get an integral uh, being uh, from 0 to pi of a half, and that just equals pi over 2. Now armed with i of 2, I can then calculate i of 4 from that recursion relation. I get a factor of 3 over 4 multiplying i of 2. And then i of 6 is going to have a factor of 5 over 6 multiplying that, and i of 8 is going to have a factor of 7 over 8 multiplying it, and so forth. And now you can see I can generalize this again. I'm getting those odd integers in the numerator, and I'm getting even integers in the denominator. I can factor out a factor of 2 from each of those terms and rewrite that in terms of an n factorial. And so we find i of 2n is equal to 2n minus 1 double factorial divided by 2 to the n times n factorial. And then there's this overall factor of pi that remains as well. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work out vd for odd dimensions. You're going to get the opportunity to work it out for even dimensions on the homework. So you might want to pay attention. There'll be similar things going on there, but the calculation is a little bit different in even dimensions than it is in the odd dimensions. So if d is equal to odd, I'm going to let it equal 2n plus 1, where n is an integer. And then let's write out what that integral is. I have an integral from 0 to r dr, r to the 2n, and then I have all these different angular integrals. And we've worked out the general formula for all the different angular integrals. Once again, that middle term should be a theta 3, not a, I'm sorry, a theta 2, not a theta 3. That's a small typo there. So let's work it out. The first integral over r is easy to do. That's going to give me r to the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n. There's a factor of 2 pi that comes from the last angle integral. And then the rest of the angle integrals, starting from the right, are going to give me i of 1 times i of 2 times i of 3, all the way out to i of 2n minus 1. So I've got this big product I've got to work out. Let's group the even and the odd i's together and evaluate them. So i of 1 times i of 3 all the way out to i of 2n minus 1. That's going to give me 2 over 1 times 2 squared times 1 over 1 times 3 times 2 cubed times 1 times 2 over 1 times 3 times 5 and so forth. And the last term is 2 to the n, n minus 1 factorial over 2n minus 1 double factorial. Let's do the same for the evens, i of 2 times i of 4 times i of 6. Plugging in our formula, I get pi over 1 divided by 2. And then the next term, i of 4, is pi times 1 times 3 divided by 2 squared times 1 times 2, and so forth. You can see this pattern develop. And now what I'm going to do is note that there are n minus 1 factors of pi that I'm going to pull out. So that give me a pi to the n minus 1. And now I'm going to very carefully compare i of 1 with i of 2. You see, if I multiply i of 1 with i of 2, I'm going to get 1. If I multiply i of 3 with i of 4, I'm going to get 1 over 2. And in general, if I multiply that, the corresponding even and odd ones together, I'm going to get a 1 over n. And I can pair every one of them except the last odd one. I have one odd one left over, i of 2n minus 1. So I have to write out the value for i of 2n plus 2n minus 1. So now let's go back to our result for v of 2n plus 1 and plug everything together. I have my, these factors that I got before, r to the 2n plus 1 times 2 pi over 2n plus 1. We have this factor of pi raised to the n minus 1 power that we pulled out of all of those even products. I get this 1 over n minus 1 factorial. when I That's all that's left over when I pair together the evens and the odds in order. And then I have the i to the 2n minus 1, which is 2 to the n, n minus 1 factorial over 2n minus 1 double factorial. Now look at what happens. The n minus 1 factorial terms cancel. 
the 2 to the n terms are going to give me 2 to the n plus 1. I'm going to get a pi to the n. And then this 2n plus 1 is just waiting to get folded into the 2n minus 1 double factorial because it's the next term in there. So that's going to give me a 2n plus 1 double factorial. So when all the dust settles, I get r to the 2n plus 1, 2 times 2 pi raised to the nth power divided by 2n plus 1 double factorial. Okay, so v to the 2n plus 1, let me repeat this formula, it looks like this fashion. And notice the r is always raised to a power, but the denominator keeps getting bigger and bigger integers in it. So once I pick an n or get to a dimension d that is bigger than r, then every time I add a new dimension, a new odd dimension, I'm going to bring in a factor of r squared times 2 pi, but I'm going to be dividing it by 2n plus 1. And as n gets bigger and bigger, I can always find a situation where 2n plus 1 is always bigger than that. And then at that point in time, this volume is going to start to shrink. And if I take the limit as d goes to infinity, then this volume is going to go to zero, regardless of what the r is, as long as the r is finite. So the volume of any finite radius sphere vanishes as d goes to infinity. That's really a remarkable and, in fact, very surprising result. You might ask, why in the heck is this happening? So remember that volume is relative to the unit cube. What is happening to the unit cube in high dimensions? It develops what is called a porcupine shape. The edge along each axis is 1, but let's look at the diagonal. That diagonal is the 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, etc., all the way out to d copies of 1 vector. The length of that is square root of d. So as d gets large, the, the diagonal actually goes to infinity. So even though the unit cube has 1 along all of its sides, it's actually becoming infinitely large. But I measure all my volumes relative to that. The sphere is always finite because everything is confined inside the radius and so it should be obvious now because the unit cube is actually diverging in size but the sphere is not that the sphere volume must vanish in high dimensions it's really a remarkable result and you can see it and understand it by carefully going through these kinds of derivations how fast does it do this well i've copied once again the formula for the odd dimensions, and here is numerical evaluations of those formulas. So I start with a dimension 1, then 3. 3 is, of course, your favorite 4 thirds pi. I'm evaluating this for a radius r equals 1. And you can see that it's got a maximum at dimension 5, and then it starts to decrease. And by the time I hit dimension of 27, it's already 10 to the minus 4 or smaller. On the right-hand side, you can see a plot of what this looks like it increases and then very rapidly decreases and by the time I get to high dimensions and it's not even all that high although it's very difficult to picture this in your head but you know only a dimension on the order of 25 or so and I can't even see the non-zero value on the curve anymore and so this actually occurs quite rapidly and I believe is a very interesting result that you get when you're able to do these kinds of multiple integrals you're going to get the opportunity to explore this a little bit further by going through this same process, but now for the even integers and looking at the even dimensions, and you'll get a result that should be very similar to the odd dimensions, but of course the exact numerical values are going to be different.